live stream tonight. We have a large part of our audience here with us and live. Mm -hmm. And um, but there are some who are on live stream with us tonight, and we're we want to welcome you and glad that you uh, are interested to join us. I had this thought while I was sitting there that. You know, anytime you get a chance to speak before the saints, you're to see it as an opportunity to rally the saints. Yeah. Uh, in a time like this, anytime we know that uh, Satan is uh, is not very happy to uh, uh, have us discuss anything of truth concerning the kingdom, and we're not so much uh, want to. I don't see myself so much as preaching to my brethren, particularly. This, you know, you have to see each group as exclusive as of, of its own. Each group is different, but as I I look at this group, I. I get an opportunity to just kind of like speak for my brethren. When, when we get up here, we're, we speak for one another so that those who hear us, I'm a, I'm a voice for you. And I, I want to be able to, what I'm saying, I want you to be able to, to amen what I'm saying. I want you, I want to be something you would say. So I, mean, I know that's the way you feel. So it, we're so, not, so much not preaching to you as we're just, pre we're preaching for you and, and our voice is being heard. Our theme tonight is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's always the main thing. Tonight we're going to remember an aspect of Jesus Christ, his birth, his coming into the world. Our last meeting, the last time we met together, incidentally, was about his coming again. This past Lord's Day, PM, we talked about him coming again. But tonight we're going to talk about when he came the first time. Which in truth, brethren, really with truth, this is the event which we're looking toward. Uh, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for him to come and get us. Now Paul was just as clear as day. When he said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but we fight against flesh and blood, but it, and, and rather against principalities and power and wickedness in high places. Paul was clear about this. The kingdom of God is not a cakewalk, is it? Uh, it's, not an, it's not for entertainment we follow after the Lord. The Apostle Paul, he's the one who teaches us how to view, actually how to, how to view our situation, how to see it. Paul calls the kingdom way, he calls it a kingdom of warfare. That's what he does, that we fight against <coughs> wickedness, and we fight to lay hold of yeah. eternal life. It's a fight, call it a good fight of faith. We lay hold of it. Yeah. And brethren, you understand yeah. words about conflict, don't you? And fighting, because we had to fight for every step we take, for every advance you make in the kingdom, you had to fight for it. Yeah. You don't come. And it's not given to you in that way. And so using words of conflict and battle, uh, and just like Paul does, I want to tell you something this evening, something that's on my heart. In this warfare into which we've been called, all of us, there have been entirely too many casualties. Do you know that? There's been too many casualties. Uh, we're, we're not talking about the world at large. I'm talking about brethren who have been enlisted to fight. There's just been too many of them uh, that's fallen back into captivity, been called back captive. We've got too many missing in action. I don't know what kind of action it is, but they sure enough missing. We don't know where they're at. So tonight we call the saints. We call them to, like, keep the ranks. We want the saints to keep the ranks. Uh, we want to, what that means is we want to advance in tight formation. Yeah. Keep it close. Keep it close. We don't want nobody getting by us. We don't want nobody getting in. So we, we, we're talking like uh, Paul would talk, maybe. Right. The saints, we need to stay close. And, and one day, when I, what we're doing tonight, Brother, one day you'll be glad we did this, Amen. that we had this special meeting, and we, and we preached the word. Yeah. It'll pay off one day. It's the right thing to do. It is. It's the right thing to do, what we're doing, yeah. to call one another to a more earnest embrace of the truth. That's one of the things we do when we fight. Now, you know, God didn't wrap Jesus up and put him under a tree all nice and pretty like men would have done. He didn't give Jesus to the world like some kind of present. The shepherds didn't, Jesus, didn't find Jesus like that, did they? But he rather he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and found lying in a manger. Mary wrapped her newborn baby in swaddling clothes and she laid him there. Nobody told her to do that. But it was to be a sign to the shepherds, wasn't it? That's what the angels told them. Again, one more time, one more time, the activity of God is marked by signs and prophecies. God's trademark, that's what he does. Prophetic signs, an evidence of the cohesiveness of Scripture, how it sticks together with a united purpose. So that his uniformity of purpose, that might sink into the minds of men, you know. 
uh, God's dealing in this way is recorded in the scriptures. They're all they're full of signs and wonders of prophecies of Jesus Christ. It was right there, remember, on the shores of Galilee after his resurrection early one morning that Jesus opened their minds, the disciples, so that he might understand that the scriptures were all about him. They needed to know that God was in him all along. That it was God that was in him all along, working out through him his purpose. Now, people ask when uh, something happens, where is God? We, we say, and they want to know, where is God at? Brother Gene talks about this. Where was God? Where is God at? Well, we, we say, didn't you hear? God is in Christ. Matter of fact, brother, we tell them, didn't you know? Everything's about him, Christ. He's all in all. As it pertains to the, to the redemptive work of God, and that's exactly what he's doing. He's redeeming man. Everything, all creation, all purposes, everything falls under this work that's in Christ Jesus. And that's the way it's going to be accomplished until that day Paul tells us that in the dispensation of time he might gather together and want all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. I don't think the saints have fully grasped this, that the scriptures are all about him. We need to take this little known passage in John 5, 39, and we need to nail it to every church door in the city. That's what we need to do. You know, Martin Luther did that 500 years ago. He found 95 things wrong with the church of his day. He wrote them on a piece of paper, and he nailed them on the church door. He called the church out on it. I think we could boil everything down today in one thing, though. We wouldn't need a, we wouldn't need a long list. Uh, but what a wonderful sight, though. Here we have Jesus and his disciples together. Again, Galilee. So then right there that morning on the shores of Galilee, Jesus cooked breakfast. Yeah. yeah. And, but that's not all he did. It's not all he did. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Jesus went back over again, you know what it says there, and he explained everything that just happened. And he, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Even though they saw it and they experienced it, they lived through it, Jesus still needed to come along and point it all out to them and open it up. It was a prophetic word concerning him that Jesus wanted the disciples to see. Jesus wanted the disciples to see this, that it was God telling them ahead of time what he fully intends to do. And that's God's way of giving men, giving men plenty of time. It is. It's, 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 it's this gracious work of God to give time. And uh, he's, uh, we'll, it, we'll, we'll see this, that, uh, that God was very gracious in this area of time, giving men plenty of time. Thousands of years before he came, Often in great detail, God declared through special ones about the coming king. All those prophecies, you know, God stood behind every one of them, didn't he? Sure did. John, Jesus fulfilled every one of them. God stood behind them. Jesus fulfilled them. Hundreds of events took place just as they were foretold. There are many prophecies that concern just his birth, just him coming into the world. Every one of them completely fulfilled. What a great work this is. No, no, I didn't miss not every one of them exactly like God said. Now, there's an illustration to help make this point, and I've given this before, I think. If just eight, if just eight of the prophecies of Christ were fulfilled, if just eight of them, the chances of this kind of thing happening outside of God is compared, if you covered the state of Texas, two foot deep in quarters, marked one with an X, had a blind man, he gets one pick, pick the right one. Peter Stoner come up, Department of Mathematics and Astronomy, figured that out. Now, we all know, we know full well everything that God has promised to do, it, it will certainly take place. And uh, with all the seemingly intrusions and all the distractions, everything that's going on, we know what God has purposed to do is like a foregone conclusion. But, you know, having this intellectual, have, knowing this in our mind, having this in our intellect, this... Um, it's really not enough. Right. I mean, we know this, but that's not enough to get you by. This salvation, it's got to become yours. It's, it's got to be, this salvation's got to be mine. 
And uh, you've got to own it. You've got to live it out. I mean, we got to know that God, I mean, we know that God, we got to know that God will keep us, and we do, we know that. But it, but it doesn't take away, does it, the difficulties of, uh, of having to live it out. Now, one of the difficulties we face, you can just, it helps, it kind of piles on that. We have to face it all the time. It's a thought or the, 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 the seeming appearance that it looks like a lot of time the work of God uh, what he's doing, the message of God, the truth, the gospel, all these things have been so garbled up, uh, so divided and put in such disarray that no, anyone can hardly see the truth of God at all. It's, it's something, it's a difficulty, that's what it is. And, uh, and, it's just, and this time of the year is, is by no means any exception. And it's been the work of Satan to do this. She said, he's the one that's behind this, creating all this disruption and intrusions and things to disrupt and mislead the world. And this he's done, but he's really after the saints. He wants to mislead them and disrupt them. And, and this is the devil's work. I can see where Satan is, is content, even this time of the year, not to take the attention off of Christ entirely, but, but he, I'd like to just corrupt it a little bit. Uh, I'd like to compromise it a little bit. It's his purpose and he's been allowed to blind the eyes of men and to stop their ears to the, what, to the truth of what God is doing in Christ Jesus. Satan doesn't care if we sing our Christmas songs about Jesus. Just do it under a Christmas tree. You know, he doesn't care. He doesn't care if Santa sings them. Santa can sing the songs too. He don't care about that. Jesus is the reason for the season. Satan's not thrown off by You ain't going to throw Satan off by that kind of talk. Uh, matter of fact, I think he likes it. I, maybe he's the one that started that, you know, to distract from the fact that uh, Jesus is not the reason for the Christmas season. Jesus is the reason, period. Amen. Jesus is the reason for everything, Amen. not just the seasons. Amen. Come on. Well, Satan, he just wants to jumble up everything, yes, just Lord. mix it all up Amen. to be the cause for every, every possible distraction. You just trace it. You trace it right back to him. Amen. Anything he can do. Uh, to mess up what the Lord was doing, he'll do it. Not only coming into this world, he's, messed, he's tried to mess that up, but his resurrection and his coming again, he's involved in that too. And these little things, you know, that uh, they're not really clearly unlawful. They're not like wrong to do, but they to kind of sidetrack our intentions. And they're good intentions, but they can get sidetracked, corrupt our good efforts, uh, particularly this time of the year, and get off on, on, the, wrong, on the wrong track. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real struggle to fight off all these secular, I call them secular intrusions into the things that are holy, uh, to remember what it means when Christ came into the world, when Christ was born. You know, God put a lot of effort and a lot of uh, work into bringing Christ into the He's created whole societies and whole governments, and he's, he's brought nations up and he's brought them down. He's done a lot. Of, he's, he's brought men, his special men, in to speak, and he's, he's removed them, and he, that's a lot of work. And uh, we know all this. And uh, God is in the world. This is the message that has to come out And uh, at this time of the year. that Christ was born, and, and the message is that God has come, and he's in this world. It's a song that we sing, and it's, Oh, spread the tidings round wherever man is found, wherever her, human heart and human woes abound. Let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound. The comforter has come. You remember singing that one? The long, long night is past. The morning breaks at last. And hush the dreadful wail and fury of the blast. As o'er the golden hill today advances fast, the comforter has come. Lo, the great king of kings with healing in his wings to captive soul of full deliverance brings. And through the vacant cells a song of triumph sings. The comforter hath come. O boundless love divine, how shall this tongue of mine to wandering mortals tell the matchless grace divine that I, a child of hell, should in its image shine. The comforter has come. Now in the seventh chapter of Isaiah, it's 400 years probably before this came to pass, a prophecy is given to, of all people, King uh, Ahaz. And the circumstances surrounding this prophecy is, is, is pretty interesting. It's something to consider. And it was a situation that come up again where they, had been, they were being threatened by another invasion of Syria. And uh, it was just pretty serious because they were, gonna give, they were getting permission to come through uh, a, a border there that had, had been blocking them. But anyway, a, uh, uh, God told Ahaz, he said, don't be concerned with this that this was certainly not going to happen. He, and the scriptures tell about that. And, and through the prophet Isaiah, God tells Ahaz, 
Just ask for a sign as a pledge. Just ask for a sign that what I've said is indeed true. But Ahaz, well, he declines God's offer. Just like men continue to do. He, he got to get an offer from God, and they thought, I don't think so. But by the tone of the response that's given to Ahaz, well, you can see it aggravated God. Uh, I mean, it aggravated God more. God was already aggravated, you remember, because back in the first chapter, uh, well, you don't use the word aggravated. It says weary. God was weary. The scriptures say God was already, this made God weary, and he was already weary, and Ahaz wearies God even more. He declines a sure blessing from God. And this is the response that he got, Ahaz. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? So you won't ask for a sign. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now this must serve as a reminder to God himself after having a deal with all of this. Uh, he, he just had to remind himself about the coming Savior, what he, what he himself was going to bring salvation. I'm thinking for sure uh, if this prophetic word here in Isaiah, if it had not been about a plan, I mean a plan that God had already made, I mean if God had not, had, not, had not already purposed in himself to do a good thing, I think the flood would have been probably a good place to just to relieve himself of all this weariness, you know, just to just to, to be done with it right then. But see, what my point is, God had a purpose. And, uh, you know, men weary God. And uh, this is uh, Ahaz weary God. I ask God uh, many times to forgive me for making him weary. I've made God weary. It's a, it's a, I don't want to make God weary. So God declares to the world, by way of Ahaz, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know, in Matthew, he has a little commentary to that. We already see the word man in Emmanuel, but uh, he says, which being interpreted is God with us. So this is uh, something that Matthew picked up on. There's a point to make, and you already know this, that really... Um, God had never really been with men before, up until Jesus came. Not in the sense of which we speak here. Not until Jesus Christ came. God had been an intercepting man along the way as far as the working of his purpose to get something done that was critical that needed to be done. God would come in and he'd get it done. But he, he, sure, he certainly kept his distance from this wicked world. There were certain men God would associate himself with. He spoke to them and he worked in them. And he had a people, he'd come among and work with them, and it was necessary to be done. But, it, it, but God always had an intercessor to work these things for him. The presence of God filled the most holy place, but he did so under strict guidelines and restrictions and things. He came down to Mount, to Mount Sinai, yet the people were told to stay back. He worked among men. He tolerated them on behalf of his purpose in Christ Jesus. Yet God, God had really never been with men. Every year about this time, there are a number of specials, Christmas specials and musicals and stories, different things like this, with some kind of warm, provoking message. It's a moral story. It's a positive message about hope and giving and loving one another. These messages are not about the hope that we talk about this in the gospel. Generally, they're not. And, and, if I, and I think back at the ones I've watched and listened to and things. Uh, as a whole, I, I don't think they come really come close at all to portraying the truth of Christ's birth. The truth of why it came, really why it came. Uh, Jesus had some things to say about his coming. Even Jesus talked about his coming. Uh, immediately after Jesus was baptized, his first stop was back home at, at, at uh, Nazareth at the synagogue. And when they handed him the scroll of Isaiah to read, he read this passage, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are captive. Jesus came to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's why he said he came. Amen. Jesus said, I didn't come to uproot the law and the prophets. I come to fulfill. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Amen. Think not that I come to bring, uh, to send peace on earth. I came 
to, uh, not to send peace, but a sword. That's what Jesus said. For I came to set a man at variance against his father and his daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. This is what Jesus said about his coming. The Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. I come to send fire on, on the earth. And what with I, what will I, if it be already kindled? Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, but rather division. For judgment I am come into the world that they which see might, that they which see not might see, and they that which see might be made blind. That thief cometh not but for to, to kill and destroy and to steal. I come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. 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 He said, I come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And he said, if I had not come and spoken, if I had not come and spoken to them, they had not sinned. But now they have no covering for their sin. And you remember what Jesus said to Pilate, don't you? Thou sayest I'm a king. To this end I was born. And for this cause I came into this world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. And every one that is of the truth Heareth my voice. Now, this is a serious and sober thing to think about this time of the year, isn't it? When Jesus, uh, when we celebrate Jesus' birth. And when we consider from his own lips why he said he came. I came in my Father's name. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. And the, Joshua, the apostle John said, Jesus came as a light into the world. I come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. One of the glaring things we, we understand about this, the most profound uh, consideration is that before Jesus came, there was utter darkness. We, sometimes we're, we're, we're just dumbfounded about things that's happened in the past, but see, men were operating in the dark. Brother, there was no light. This is what Jesus meant when he said, for judgment I've come into the world that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And the proclamation of heaven, what was declared to the shepherds, is glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, it was goodwill toward men. God in Christ extending his good will, his good pleasure, his goodness toward men. Now, we read in the Old Testament, and we, we've studied a, a great deal in the Old Testament, and we've focused on a lot of things that, and events that took place there, and we've wondered uh, uh, about the problems and the difficulties and the things that men did back then. But, uh, you know, they, they had no Savior, and they had no light. God had not yet come. And there was darkness all around, all around them. Men couldn't find their way, brethren. Even when the way was told to them, God told them how to live. God told us how to live. But we just couldn't do it. Even those who wanted to come, they could not come. They wanted, they could not come. Job said, oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. There was uh, this difficulty even of the God-fearing and, and those who wanted God, they, they were ready to come, but could, would not, could not. Jesus Christ has come as a Savior to the whole entire world. Yeah. He's come to the whole world, brethren. Now men can come to God. Yeah. They can come to God. Yeah. We, can come, we can come to God in Christ Jesus. And you know, Jesus is happy to take us to God yeah. if we come. And this world that he's come to, you know, by the way, it belongs to him. Yeah. It's his world. Right. I think men think it belongs to them. Yeah. I mean, uh, men are all the time wondering about and worrying about what they're going to do about this and how we're going to fix that and how we're going to start this. Uh -huh. Managing the world. That's not what men need to be worrying about. Uh -huh. What's, <laughs> managing the world. Really, the church needs to get the, really the church needs to get off. And, and just start preaching the gospel and telling, and telling them who the world belongs to. They would just come out if they would preach it and just tell everybody, well, the world, it, it belongs to the Lord, and he bought it and he paid for every one of it. And the world lies under condemnation, doesn't it? 
You know, I, uh, Jesus visited Jerusalem. It was the city of God, Jerusalem. And they were the people of God. Jesus was sent to them, incidentally. And he came to save it, Jerusalem and the people of God. He came, he preached among them, and he came to save it. But at the end of his ministry, Jesus wept over it. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't weep over it because he was unable to do that. What he would, you know, it's not, it's, it's that they wouldn't come to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jesus didn't save them anyway. Whose Savior is Christ? Well, he's every man's Savior, yes. brethren. Mm -hmm. He came for every man. He was born in this world for every man. All those who come to him. But right now, tonight, though, he's our Savior. You know, that's how we're thinking tonight. Uh, he's our, for all those who come to him, he's your Savior. Right now, think about it, that he came for you. He came for you. He came for me. I know that he came for the body of Christ. But it's made up of members. So, you know, Christ came for you and me and each one of us. He, that's, the way we, that's the way we think about it. And tonight, Christ is calling all men to come to him. All those who come, he will in no way cast out. Yeah. Now, I want you to know something. Christ is calling you. He's calling you right now. Are you going to come or not? That's what I want to know. Amen. I mean, Christ is calling you. Okay, Say, I've come. If Christ is still calling you, are you going to come? Christ calls all men to come. But you know, in this parable of the 90 and 9, Christ is seen as the one going out to find yeah. men. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Jesus asked this question, How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the 90 and 9 and goeth into the mountains and, and seeth that which is gone astray? Mm -hmm. To whom was Jesus sent? The Scripture say to the whole world, Yet in this parable... He's working, he's working to return those who have gone astray. We just can't ignore this parable. There's a number that belongs to God. There's a number that belongs to God. And they're out there lost, worn and around. Well, who came to find them? Jesus came. Jesus is depicted as the shepherd gathering these strays to God. One by one, he rounds them up and he brings them in. And this is the work of God. In this world today, he's gathering the people of God. He's, Christ is doing it for him. Amen. He's preparing them for glory. God is on the earth doing this today. He's doing it right now in his person. Christ is doing this, yeah. gathering men. Amen. Now, you know that when uh, Jesus left here, he told the disciples, you know, uh, that he, 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 he would not be here much longer. And we know today that Christ is not here. Why well, he's, well, he's in glory. He's, uh, he's officiating and he's a mediating uh, for the saints. Uh, but God is here. God is with us. He is in the spirit of Christ, Jesus. He is in the Holy Spirit who comes and he brings God to dwell within us. Jesus told disciples, I'm leaving and your hearts are heavy because I go. Where I go, you cannot come, but I go to prepare a place for you. Yeah. And can I say I go to prepare you for a place? Yeah, right. The reality, Jesus abides in us, and where Jesus is, guess what? The Father is there also. God is with yeah. us. He's in this world. He's in the saints, and God has done this. He's done it in the man, Christ Jesus, because we, we have a man in, in, in heaven, because God, he is, uh, he is, he is with us. Now, the real point of what needs to be seen, what the world needs to see, and why the angels were rejoicing that night, that God can now be with men because God had become a man, you see. He had taken on the likeness of flesh. This is the marvelous thing about it, that he had come alongside of men. And the apostle John, he, he, he's a testimony to this. He tells us, we witness and testify to you, and, and he was full of grace and truth. And we received of him all of his fullness we've received grace for grace because he was God in the flesh and the very first verse of still John the apostle and, the, and later on now he's an old man old aged apostle he would reflect back on Jesus and he would say that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled 
the word of life. So uh, this is the Apostle Paul giving witness that God had come in the flesh. You know, from one perspective, Jesus had a hard message to proclaim, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I just can't get over that sometimes. And all people, he had to proclaim it to, the Jews, that God was his father. But he did it. He did it. He, he, he preached it to them. The hardest message you could think about preaching to the Jews was this, but he preached it. Now, tonight, it's our comfort and encouragement to know that as a great high priest, Christ, he reigns yes. over the house of God. Now, he's a, he's a, because he's coming to the world, is what I'm saying, he's a high priest who can be, he can be touched with the infirmities, the feelings of our infirmities. Yes. And he, like all points, he, he was tempted like us. Of course, he didn't sin. He sits in glory in a very high place. And he's, Christ has taken the high ground for us. And, then, and so he's, he's, uh, he's executing his salvation, and he's calling every one of us through victory after victory. He's bringing all of us who belong to God into the fold of God. This is where they belong. He's doing this. He's positioned himself in a place where this can be done. Now, when we remember his birth, when, while we remember his birth, what a more marvelous and glorious thing it is. <coughs> but we're not going to hang around here too long, right. brethren, because he's coming back. Right. Amen. And, and he's coming back to take all those who he came to save. We look at his birth, and we, we marvel at his birth, and we, we see that Christ is coming to the world, and God with men, and, and we kind of look past it, and we look. To the coming of Christ Jesus, we look to Him coming again, and uh, so that's 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 the kind of message we get when we we realize that Jesus has come, and so uh, when He's coming again, He's coming to get us. You know, uh, I I keep thinking about Jesus has He has come, and He's come to call men to Him. And how that he uh, he goes out and searches for each one, and he doesn't give up. And now it's been thousands of years since he's come, and he's still gathering men unto himself. So, brethren, tonight uh, when we we reflect on the the birth of Christ and his coming into the world, I pray that. Um, it will, it will bring you comfort, and it will bring you strength uh, to know that uh, all these things he's done for each of us and that uh, and, and, and somehow uh, those who have not come to Christ, that they will, they will see this as reason enough to come. In Christ's name, uh, we, we pray this. Thank you, brethren. Amen.